If Dominique Vivant Denon, master of Napoleon's Paris Mint and first director of the Louvre Museum, served as the hero of our first episode, then most assuredly this man, the brilliant Milanese neoclassical painter Andrea Appiani, is the hero of our second. Long before Dinon, a rather indifferent artist, but an inspired connoisseur, attached himself to the coattails of the great warrior Napoleon, a truly gifted artist, Andrea Appiani, lent his estimable talents to the glorification of Napoleon's military prowess and the justification of his right to rule Italy. What is more, and far the more dangerous too, is that Appiani, an Italian, willingly, enthusiastically lent his talents to Napoleon, just as Dinon, a Frenchman, would later do. But unlike Dinon, Appiani's artistic efforts would lead to the subjugation of his own country by another, and to the consolidation of Napoleon's power and authority in Italy. This was the paradox at the heart of Appiani's career, and it would cause him great strife in later years. Dinon would be ennobled for his support of Napoleon, and even after the great warrior's abdication, could retire into private life to quietly enjoy his own little hoard of treasures that he had incidentally acquired while helping Napoleon loot the riches of European art history. As to Appiani, he would suffer a stroke, permanently sapping him of his artistic powers, and would go on to die in ignominious penury having been stripped by another invader, the disdainful Austrian emperor, now restored to power, of the life pension Napoleon had doled out to Appiani, as a reward for having made the Frenchman look distinctly like a true Italian king. Revenge, indeed, is a dish best served cold. Like Andrea Appiani, even the great Italian sculptor Antonio Canova had been convinced by Napoleon to lend his talents to the great persuaders project of the subjugation of Italy and of the hearts and minds of the Italians. After much reluctance and prevarication, Canova finally agreed in 1802 to start work on a huge heroic statue of Napoleon carved in marble, presenting him, perhaps with intentional irony, as Mars, the peacemaker. Likely, with even greater irony, Canova carved Napoleon almost three and a half metres high and gave him the body of a Greek god, features that the rather weedy little Corsican did not in person possess, and this is perhaps the reason why Napoleon ultimately rejected it. It was too ridiculous, even for Napoleon's over-exaggerated perception of himself. While the original statue is now in the Duke of Wellington's former home, Apsley House in London, a fine bronze copy cast in 1811 has stood in the courtyard of Andrea Appiani's alma mater, the Accademia di Belle Arti di Brera in Milan since 1859. But Canova, himself dedicated to the dream of Italian unification, would eventually, like the rest of Italy, come to realise that Napoleon, Italy's erstwhile liberator from the Habsburgs, had not the slightest interest in helping unify Italy under Italian governance. Italy was, for Bonaparte, simply to become another satrapy in the Napoleonic Empire and a quarry from which he could mine and exploit the wealth of European art history. Napoleon had not been subtle or disingenuous about his intentions. In fact, by the time he had crossed the little bridge at the Battle of Lodi on the 11th of May 1796 and driven Beaulieu and the Austrians into the marshes and behind the fortress walls of Mantua where they were besieged by Napoleon, Bonaparte virtually declared he was more than willing and able to ruthlessly drain from the Italians the best art they possessed as remuneration for having the temerity to defend themselves from the French and as trophies to Napoleon's incipient glorification of himself. He told the Duke of Modena exactly what he wanted in the armistice that he signed with him on the 12th of May, 1796. He wanted the Duke's art, not to mention 
7,500,000 livres, and some other trifles of warfare, such as provisions and gunpowder. What is more, Napoleon wanted only the best art the Duke could offer. Determined by connoisseurs, specially appointed by Napoleon, to ferret out masterpieces. Here are Napoleon's demands, in his own words, taken from the text of the armistice. The Duke of Modena shall be bound to deliver twenty paintings, to be selected in his gallery, or in any part of his states, at the choice of citizens who shall be commissioned to that effect. In exchange, Napoleon promised that the Republican troops will pass by the states of the Duke of Modena without taking any acquisitions. Nothing persuades like power, the power to take anything you want, whenever you want to take it. As to the Duke of Modena, he had run off to Venice and sent his younger brother to obsequiously capitulate to Napoleon. Theft of art from the enemies of the people was an established French Republican tradition by now, meant to extract works of art from private collections so that the common people, not just the privileged aristocracy of Europe, could enjoy them. Napoleon was pleased to follow this new tradition, which allowed him to garner approbation from his current masters, the Directory, but also to help the common people always remember they were indebted to General Bonaparte for the privilege. Perhaps it was this raw power too that had convinced Canova to lend his talents to Napoleon. But long before Canova agreed to carve Napoleon's statue, the legend goes that Canova had demonstrated that he had seen through to Napoleon's real intentions and that he was only pretending to be inspired and won over by the young general. Further, Canova had even cheekily revealed his barely concealed disdain and outrage to Bonaparte in person at a ball held at Napoleon's headquarters, the Villa Manin in Passariano, where the Treaty of Campo Formio was signed on the 17th of October, 1797, and which finally made peace with Austria and ended the first Italian campaign. The story, whether apocryphal or not, certainly very nicely summarises the horror and anger that must have been felt by all who valued Italy's artistic patrimony and could not bear to see it looted by Napoleon. It should be noted that not long before this supposed incident, Napoleon, a Corsican, had decided to Frenchify his name by changing it from the Italian-sounding Buonaparte to the more francophone and francophile Bonaparte. Italians are all thieves, declared Napoleon at the ball at the Villa Manin in Passariano. Not all of them, replied Canova, stepping forward to challenge the young general. But, Canova continued, buona parte. This clever pasquinade was most apt, since the homonym buona parte exactly spells both Napoleon's original surname and simultaneously translates into Italian as many of them, forming a seemingly obsequious mask to the implication that Napoleon not only was more Italian than French, but that he was the greatest thief of them all. This was the pot calling the kettle black, and what surely makes this anecdote all the more poignant is that it was Canova himself who was, after the final defeat of Napoleon, commissioned to examine all the artworks looted by the French and to offer his suggestions as to which pieces should be returned to Italy. Revenge, indeed, is a dish best served cold. But if Canova cleverly escaped Napoleon's web, how did Appiani find himself so readily entangled in it? And how did Appiani's work become the inspiration for the brilliant series of medals produced at the Milan Mint by La Vie and Salvirk, celebrating Napoleon's first Italian campaign? By the time Napoleon met Andrea Appiani in 1796, and had his portrait sketched by Appiani for a painting celebrating Napoleon's victory at the Battle of Lodi. The 42-year-old artist was considered perhaps the preeminent exponent of the neoclassical school in the north of Italy. 
the Italian Jacques-Louis David, so to speak. However, while David had early on nailed his colours to the mast in no uncertain terms, Appiani's political beliefs and aspirations are a little less easy to grasp at this point. David had already used his talents to glorify the revolution and its martyrs, such as Marat, employing the crisp, clear, pure lines and contours, the muted colours, the austere forms and the restraint and understatement of neoclassicism to permanently sear into the minds of the people the correctness and righteousness and the heroism and self-sacrifice of this vanguard of the people. Here we have no doubt that David sees Marat as the dead Christ, sacrificed upon the cross of the revolution. It is a pietà. See here Anibale Caracci's Pietà with Two Angels of 1603 as a comparison. The only difference is the absence of Mary and her attendant angels. Mary, after all, is the real sufferer in the Pietà. In David's painting, the loneliness of the figure of Marat, faintly illumined by an unearthly light against the darkness behind his limp and lifeless body, concentrates the horror of the event and accentuates our sense that we, the viewers, are intended to take the place of the absent Mary and angels, the grief-stricken mourners who have lost her son and saviour. Self-denial in the service of the people and the republican state was David's raison d'être, as demonstrated by his early paintings, such as the Oath of the Horatii of 1786, the Death of Socrates of 1787, and the Lictors Bring to Brutus the Bodies of His Sons of 1789. Though it was powerful propaganda, David never used it cynically, he may have been fanatical, but he was a true believer. On the other hand, Appiani seems not to have initially used his talents and the concentrated power that could be summoned up with neoclassicism for any overtly political agenda like David. By 1796, Appiani was already well established in Milanese society. He was well known for his fine portraits of high society figures and for his chiaroscuro painting, and his magnificent religious frescoes, the most recent of which was his Evangelists and Doctors of the Church, painted in 1795 for the cupola of the Church of Santa Maria de Miracoli in Milan, considered one of his finest masterpieces. At this point, Appiani was probably more committed to his art than to politics, and more concerned to provide for his growing family and his wife, Constanza Bernabai who he had married not long before. Certainly, Appiani seemed happy enough to take a major commission in 1791 to paint the story of love and psyche for the Habsburg ruler of Lombardy, the brother of the Austrian emperor, Archduke Ferdinand. It was an anniversary gift from Ferdinand to his wife to be painted in the Rotonda delle Sere of the royal palace at Monza, a nice little coffee nook for the lovebirds, joining the kitchen wing with the orangerie. If Appiani was averse to the Austrians ruling his country, which he might very well have been, we don't know about it, and he certainly did not protest about it openly by refusing Austrian cash. How could he? By 1795, then, Appiani had made it in Milanese society. He had started out as the son of a poor doctor, and his father had wanted him to follow in his footsteps, but Appiani rejected this path when he was only fifteen years old, and told his father so. See, Mr. Father, I am at the door of the fine arts. I am about to enter the sanctuary that touches my heart. What would I be in the face of medical art? Appiani, the boy, had decided that art was his passion, and that it would be his life's work too. Slowly, painfully, yet purposefully, Appiani climbed the ladder of Milanese society through a single-minded dedication, exceptional talent and unremitting effort. 
falling on hard times when his father died and having to resort to painting the backdrops and curtains and costumes for La Scala Opera House and cobbling together a precarious living, decorating carriages and painting flowers onto silk. But gradually he was given work more challenging and fitting to his growing talents so that by 1790 he could produce a brilliant work like the head of La Coon which radiates the essential quality demanded by the messiah of neoclassicism, Johann Joachim Winkelmann. Noble simplicity and sedate grandeur. By 1795, the two main unshakable pillars of political power in Milan, the Catholic Church and the Habsburg Empire, had drawn Appiani into their circles of trust. Appiani's mountain had been climbed. The threat of failure and penury was all behind him now. And then came Napoleon. A bittersweet reminder of Andrea Arpiani's meeting with Napoleon in Milan in 1796 can be found in a number of important print collections around the world, including the Bibliothèque Nationale de France. France's National Library, as well as in the British Museum. It is a collection of engravings by a talented group of artists, Francesco and Giuseppe Rosaspina, Giuseppe Longhi, Giuseppe Benaglia and Michele Bisci. What the engravings show are I Fasti di Napoleone, or in English, The Glories of Napoleon but they could just as aptly be described as the glories of Andrea Arpiani, because they record in minute detail most of the scenes from a brilliant cycle of 39 tempera paintings on monochrome canvas that Arpiani completed between 1800 and 1807 to glorify Napoleon's heroic deeds. All the way from the Battle of Montenotte to the Battle of Friedland, and which Appiani used to decorate the railing of the balcony of the famous Sala delle Cariatidi in the Palazzo Real, or Royal Palace of Milan. I use the word bittersweet for two reasons. Firstly, because although they fortunately record Appiani's masterpiece for posterity, it was with this huge frieze cycle in a royal palace confiscated by Napoleon from the Austrians that Appiani indelibly stamped himself in the minds of Napoleon's enemies as Napoleon's man. And secondly, because the frieze cycle is one of the greatest masterpieces of Italian neoclassical art that was completely destroyed by the bombing and shelling of the Allies when they invaded Milan in 1943 to try to expel the Axis powers from the city. All we have left of them, except for some photographs, are the engravings of I Fasti di Napoleone to tell us what Appiani's masterpiece looked like and what he was trying to convey to us. That Napoleon was pleased with Appiani's work is not in question, since it was the great persuader himself who ordered that Appiani's paintings be reproduced in engravings, so that not only those few who were fortunate enough to be able to visit the Palazzo Real in Milan could appreciate Napoleon's brilliance, but so that the whole civilised world could know the godlike deeds of Napoleon. And for the artist who was referred to by many as the painter of the graces, and was often compared to Raphael, the rewards from Napoleon were profuse and came in rapid succession. Napoleon seemed so pleased and enamoured with Appiani's work that it seems as if he got the artist to do almost everything artistic in the early days of the French regime in Lombardy. There was the famous first portrait of Napoleon, of course, but also, initially, the hackwork of invasion. Designs for allegories, patents, proclamations and heroic letterheads for the conquering generals and their staff, so that the business of taking over the state could be carried out with bureaucratic efficiency and be given the right philosophical and moral direction. Revolutionary, of course, with the freedom and the rights of man close to the top of the agenda, 
but only after heroic self-sacrifice in the service of the state preceded it, of course. See here on the letterhead of one of Napoleon's generals how Appiani strikes the right revolutionary tone and presents us with a valuable lesson. The patriotic warrior prefers to cast himself into the flames of hell rather than to accept defeat. Bellona, the goddess of war, representing the French liberators, with the French Republican Phrygian cap surmounting her spear, points to his heroic self-sacrifice as an example to us all. As to the mood of the time, see here an engraving by Appiani, dated two years later than his first meeting with Napoleon in 1796. It gives us the impression, unless Appiani is being rather cynical here, which goes against the reputation he had amongst his friends and pupils as a sincere and warm-hearted fellow, that perhaps Appiani was actually sympathetic to the French, or at least sympathetic to the bright and hopeful Republican future that Napoleon seemed to promise the Italians. It should be noted that at this time, in 1798, the French Republican army had occupied Bologna and Ferrara and defeated the armies of the Pope, marking the end of the authority of the Catholic Church over northern Italy. Here we see Bellona, the Roman goddess of war, standing before the Tree of Liberty, her spear surmounted by the Phrygian cap, and between her and the tree stand the Roman fasces. All three were symbols of the French revolutionaries who were seeking liberté, égalité and fraternity, the central ideals of the French Revolution, now translated into the Italian context by the French. Bologna, who clearly represents the French invaders, or in this case, liberators, the army of Italy, is holding out a helping hand to a young woman in the process of rising from the ground, her discarded helmet and shield and spear cast down uselessly upon the earth around her. She is Roma, the personification of the city of Rome, representing all of Italy, and she is prostrate before a temple representing the papacy and the Catholic Church that has been set on fire by victory, the young man with wings who turns to show Bellona what he has done in her name. He holds up the shackles that he has broken to release Roma from the clutches of the papacy. As the temple burns, demons representing the superstitions of the Catholic Church flee the temple in alarm and distress, beset by weeping and lamentations. It is an exceptionally effective piece of propaganda, communicated by an easy mixture of humble Republican symbolism and erudite neoclassical iconography, telling all the Italians, whether classically educated or not, just how Napoleon's French revolutionary ideals will set them free from the chains of tyranny. It must have been an intoxicating promise, ultimately an empty one, but one that no Italian could have predicted. For the moment, then, all looked rosy and beatific. Surely here, Appiani is nailing his colours to the mast, just as David had done in his painting The Death of Marat, and just like every other Italian, apart from the aristocracy or clergy, Appiani too must have been carried along by the wave of joy sweeping the north of Italy by Napoleon's victories. But was Appiani a true believer? At this point, I suppose he was. Here followed a series of triumphs for Appiani, who willingly engaged with Napoleon's regime. Let us name just a few. Firstly, portraits. A seemingly endless series of wonderful portraits of Napoleon and his family and Napoleon's inner circle began to cascade at this point from Appiani's brush and over the coming years of French invasion. Portraits of the wealthy and the famous, remember, are always a nice little earner for artists. Then came sinecures. Napoleon made Appiani senior commissioner for research into scientific and art objects, which was the preeminent government authority established by Napoleon to loot all the most important and valuable artworks from Lombardy and the Veneto to send to Paris. Today, this alone would have made Appiani complicit in war crimes, 
but that was in another time altogether, and, as L. P. Hartley once said, the past is a foreign country. They do things differently there. A further sinecure came in 1802, when Napoleon made Appiani Commissioner of the Cisalpine Republic's Entertainment, and to celebrate Republic Day on the 2nd of June 1803, Appiani designed a huge wooden circus inspired by the Roman Circus Maximus. Then came travel for Appiani. Napoleon sent him to Paris in 1801, and later he was present for Napoleon's coronation as Emperor in Paris in 1804. In Paris, Appiani met the god of neoclassicism, an intimate and a devotee of Napoleon's, Jacques Louis David, which added a particular Davidian quality to Appiani's subsequent neoclassicism. Then there was property. In 1797, Napoleon awarded Appiani a house on the Naviglio San Marco in Milan, which the French regime had confiscated from a monastery there when they seized church property and abolished church privileges. Then came commissions. Apart from I Fasti di Napoleone, mentioned before, Napoleon also commissioned Appiani to paint a number of monumental frescoes, including the Apotheosis of Napoleon in the Palazzo Reale in Milan and the Parnassus in the Villa Reale in 1812. And finally came the honours. Napoleon eventually showered many honours down upon Appiani's head, including the Légion d'Honneur and the Order of the Iron Crown, and made him court painter by naming him First Painter of Italy and appointing Appiani Director of the Brera Museum and Academy. After all these bounties were laid at the feet of Appiani, did he feel any twinge of guilt or sense of personal or national betrayal by profiting both artistically and financially from the French occupation? In any case, could we blame him for peaceably acquiescing to it all? Hardly. After all, he was an artist, seemingly apolitical, and at the height of his powers when Napoleon arrived in 1796, and he was, like the rest of Lombardy, simply swapping one occupier, the Habsburgs, for another. This was an accommodation the Italian states had been doing for centuries and grown used to. If he had not been painting terrific and thrilling frescoes and portraits for a modern-day hero, Appiani's neoclassical bent would have induced him to do the same for Greek or Roman heroes and gods from the distant past. It was a golden opportunity. How could a brilliant painter, at the apex of his genius, pass by the opportunity, merely for some distant dream of national emancipation and unification, to do something completely new and exciting, not to mention profitable and reputation-building? How could Appiani cast aside the chance to transmit the idealism and grandeur of neoclassicism, to which he had been committed since a youth, through the person of such a unique man as Napoleon, occupier though he presently was, who promised in any case to eventually free Italy as a whole from the yoke of feudalism and the tyranny of the Catholic Church forever, and to turn the Italian boot in an instant from top to toe into a republic and place power in the hands of the Italian people. Concern that this instant may never actually eventuate, probably receded with the passing years and with Appiani's growing reputation and his wealth. But who knows, perhaps Appiani had simply become one of Napoleon's true believers, right from the very beginning, as his little engraving of Bellona freeing Roma suggests. There were a multitude of devotees in those years and long after, and certainly there were reasons to celebrate the strong hand of Napoleon across a fractured and fractious and bickering gaggle of states like the Italians. With all of his looting of Italy's treasures and seizing of property, Napoleon had also introduced an efficient centralised government that predictably levied taxes, modernised education, 
abolished inequitable feudal and ecclesiastical privileges, facilitated trade and commerce by improved infrastructure like roads, not to mention an attempt to have all citizens treated with some sense of equality before the law. Even the Jews! How could we blame Appiani? Not even Canova in the coming years, who was certainly leery of Napoleon and hungry for Italian emancipation and unification, could pass up the opportunity to chisel a Bonaparte just one more time, and it would be in the guise of a victorious god again too. But this time the victor was not Napoleon, the warrior. It was his sister, Paolina Borghese, the conqueror of men's hearts, Venus Victrix. But let us turn again to one of Appiani's earliest works for Napoleon, his fine propagandistic engraving of 1798, showing Bellona rescuing the Italians from the slavery of the papacy and the Roman Catholic Church. There's a little detail hidden in the engraving that warrants our attention. The medals hanging from the Tree of Liberty. If we look closely, we can see that these medals are some of the very same we are concentrating on in this episode, the Milan Mint Medals, engraved by La Vie and Salviac, celebrating Napoleon's victories in the First Italian Campaign, which goes to show that by 1798 Appiani had already decided upon the designs of four of the medals, and they may have already been struck at the Milan Mint by this date. Let's work through them one by one. It's unclear just when Napoleon conceived the idea of seizing power away from the Directory, his bosses in Paris, and taking over the governance of France for himself. What is clear, however, is that it was straight after Napoleon's fateful crossing of the Adder River Bridge at Lodi in 1796 that Napoleon suddenly began to see himself no longer simply as an actor in a drama written by other hands, but as the author of his own destiny. He said as much in his memoirs, written on the island of St. Helena. After the Battle of Lodi, where the common soldiers lauded Napoleon as their little corporal for getting personally involved in the action, though not as heroically as the legend asserts, he told his aide, Colonel Auguste Marmont, they haven't seen anything yet. In our time, no one has the slightest conception of what is great. It is up to me to give them an example. In his memoirs, Napoleon wrote, From that moment I foresaw what I might be. Already I felt the earth flee from beneath me, as if I were being carried into the sky. The historian Jacques Jacquin asserts, this is the moment when he becomes convinced that he has a lucky star and that he's been chosen to accomplish great things. Paul Barat, the leader of the Directory, before appointing Napoleon commanding general of the Army of Italy in 1796, had already perceived this special quality in Napoleon and warned his brother directors accordingly. Advance this man, or he will advance himself without you. We must remember that it was very soon after this key moment in history that Napoleon sat in Milan for his first portrait by Andrea Appiani. The young general was just then energised by enormous self-belief, huge ambition, and by that curious freedom of action that grips men who had thought they were going to die and yet survived. And in Appiani's portrait of him, Napoleon, always an astute judge of talent, could see he had before him an artist of genius and a match in art for his own genius in war and as a leader of men. More to the point, Napoleon could see that here he had an artist with the ability to convey to the world just how much the world needed Napoleon. And so it began, this dangerous symbiosis between Napoleon and Appiani. As long as Napoleon's star was on the rise, so was Appiani's, and as long as Appiani's skills endured, so could Appiani reflect Napoleon's brilliance back down from the heavens onto the earth. 
Although we don't know who first conceived the brilliant idea to strike medals to commemorate Napoleon's victories in the first Italian campaign, we can be sure that when it entered Napoleon's mind, either as the germ of an idea or else originated from the overheard musings of someone else, it was grasped upon immediately by the young general as an inspired way to surreptitiously advertise and glorify and even magnify his achievements in Italy so that he could build his own destiny by making anyone in France or Italy who got hold of one of the medals forever remember him and his victories. Further, it was a backhanded way of vicariously awarding medals of valour to his soldiers where no such awards were permitted by a revolutionary government which valued anonymous self-sacrifice as one of its highest ideals and jealously enforced it, perhaps for fear of a coup d'etat by a powerful general. By the way, this may in fact be one of the reasons the Directory thought it a good idea to subsequently pack Napoleon and his army of Italy off to God-forsaken Egypt across the seas where something conveniently untoward might happen to the little upstart. Be that as it may, whoever conceived the medals, Napoleon engaged Appiani to design them, and we know what Appiani's original designs probably looked like, because he seems to have painted them onto the balcony rail of the Sala delle Cariatidi in the Palazzo Reale in Milan. Although destroyed in World War II, as we have seen, they were fortunately recorded for posterity in I Fasti di Napoleone. Here are four of them. The message on each is presented in Appiani's crisp, clear, evocative, neoclassical style. From the left, see here the original design for the Battle of Melesimo and Combat at Dago Medal, with, however, instead of the names of the military engagements, the simple, abbreviated Latin inscription Exercitus. Italia Maximae Virtutis, which translates into something like the most powerful army of Italy. Next, we have the Battle of Castiglione and Combat at Peschiera Medal, with the inscription Exercitus Italia Semper Victori, which translates into The Army of Italy is Always the Victor. Then we have the Mantua Medal, with the inscription Mantue deditio, meaning the surrender of Mantua. On an accompanying engraving of I Fasti di Napoleone, we find the last of the four Milan mint medals that we know Appiani personally designed. Here it is in the centre, the crossing of the Tagliamento River medal, with the inscription Aita per Tilaventum, which translates to Crossing the Tagliamento. All four are masterclasses in neoclassical iconography with crystal clear meanings and textbook Latin inscriptions to accompany them. Appiani must have been rightly proud of his designs for Napoleon's medals because he included them in one of his portraits of Josephine, Empress of the French and Queen of Italy, painted around 1808. See here the cameo parur worn by Josephine, especially the gold collar or choker, which is studded with red and white onyx cameos, which exactly mirror three of the Milan mint medals. Starting at her cleavage, we see the Millesimo and Dago design, the crossing of the Tagliamento design, and finally the Castiglione and Peschiera design. If the choker was never really made by a jeweller, but was simply an invention of Appiani's, then it should have been. Perhaps Sapiani hoped that once Napoleon saw the portrait, he would take the hint and have it produced, since the presence of the hero draped over Josephine's chest implies that Napoleon had already conquered Josephine's heart. Let us illustrate the two points mentioned before about the purpose in striking the Milan Mint medals. Firstly, that the medals were intended by Napoleon to build his reputation to further his destiny and secondly, to vicariously reward his soldiers, thereby bonding them closer to him. On the first point, note that while the Milan Mint medals do not carry a portrait of Napoleon, 
that would be seen as shameless self-aggrandizement and a hanging offence in revolutionary France. Most of them carry a raised inscription struck onto the edge of the medal, which boldly states, Bonaparte, General en Chef, or in English, Bonaparte, General in Chief. This raised edge inscription, being an unusual feature and somewhat technically difficult to achieve, would have immediately drawn the attention of a keen-eyed owner of one of these medals, reinforcing Napoleon's unique statue in the curious observer's mind, who was bound thereafter to endlessly draw it to the attention of any of his less acute confrères. What a brilliantly subtle feature, aimed specifically at magnifying Napoleon's importance. But here, Napoleon was only just getting started with his propaganda, because while none of the medals carries a portrait of Napoleon on the obverse, almost all carry the image of a hero. Now we are bound to ask ourselves, as keen-eyed owners of such a medal, who on each of these medals is the hero meant to be? Let us take the first medal, the Battle of Millesimo and the Combat at Dago, as our primary example. Since it's not only the most accomplished, but the remaining medals tend to follow a similar pattern, with the obverse illustrating an heroic action and the reverse carrying a simple statement of approbation from the French government for the Army of Italy's deeds in each case. This first medal was engraved by Carlo Michele Lavi, engraver at the Turin Mint. The first thing we note when comparing Appiani's design with the final medal is that the Latin inscription Exercitus Italia Maximae Virtutis, the most powerful army of Italy, has been replaced by a French inscription instead, Bate de Melesimo, Combat de Dego, which immediately tells us two important things. Firstly, the medals are intended for a broad popular audience, including the common soldiery, who may not be classically educated, and that further, the intended audience is primarily the French nation, not the Italian. Secondly, it tells us that someone, we won't say who, but we all probably know, has decided to remove from the medal the implication given to Heracles by Appiani, that he represents the most powerful army of Italy. The question is left to linger in the minds of the viewer. Who or what could this hero Heracles represent? Let us examine the medal closely. Here we see the hero Heracles with his classic iconography. As the historian Wayne Hanley points out, Heracles, as a symbolic image, had a long history in France, initially associated with the kings of France, but then appropriated by the Republic as a symbol of the strength and wisdom of the French people in overcoming despotism and tyranny. So, to any Frenchman viewing this medal, it would be rich with subconscious associations and with mixed emotions. What, the viewer would have to ask themselves, did it represent in this case? Note how closely it compares to previous works of art of the Italian Renaissance referencing the classical iconography of Heracles, such as Antonio del Polleolo's 1475 Hercules and the Hydra. The stance is almost identical with both of the artists capturing Heracles with his club drawn back, ready to strike the Hydra. Heracles is engaged in the second of his labours, battling the Linnaean Hydra with its many heads, which, even if struck off, will quickly regrow. Even if only one head remains, multiple heads would continue to spring from it, and because the Hydra's breath is deadly poisonous, Heracles will eventually be overcome by the fumes. While at first the hero may be seen as innocently representing the whole army of Italy, overcoming the seemingly endless resources and multiple relentless army columns of the Austrian and the Sardinian armies, in the absence of Appiani's identifying Latin inscription, we are bound to link in our minds the image of the solitary hero battling the monster with a reminder of who was the general in charge of that army and, of course, the edge inscription tells us that the hero is none other than Napoleon. Let us consider 
the somewhat confused logic of the iconography here. Heracles is using his famous club against the Hydra, a somewhat less than efficient implement for slicing through reptilian flesh, which I suppose makes Heracles even more magnificent in strength and skill, and his nephew, Aeolaus, who is supposed to be carrying the firebrand instead of it lying upon the ground, so that he can cauterize the decapitated stumps of the Hydra, is nowhere to be seen. However, perhaps Napoleon liked it that way. The only hero necessary to dispatch the Austrians and Sardinians was Napoleon alone. What emphasizes the impression that Napoleon is meant to be the true hero in our minds is that we know that the medal celebrates a full battle at Milesimo, which is, of course, where Napoleon was in charge, while at Dego there was only a combat, because it was there that Napoleon's Aeolos, his subordinate General Massena, was in charge. No wonder Aeolos is absent from the obverse. He is far away from Napoleon, fighting a so-called minor skirmish at Dego, which just so happened in real life to have saved Napoleon's bacon. To provide plausible deniability for Napoleon's boasting, the reverse carries the simple declaration of the Council of Ancients of the Corps Législative, recorded as the law dated 6 Floreal en Carte of the Republic, the French people to the Army of Italy. As David Bloch in his article The Five Battles explains, the constitution of the year Toi has an interesting provision to guard against the governments overthrown by the military. The councils were limited in the praise they might give for military victories to stating that such and such an army deserved well of the Republic. This highest praise they might give was voted five times to General Bonaparte's army, and the four Appiani pictures were used for medallic illustrations of four of the events so honoured. While the four medals were prepared, it was decided to add a fifth medal for the fifth honoured battle, the Battle of Lodi. So, by noting on the reverse the simple statement, the French people to the army of Italy, Napoleon was appearing in words to follow the constitution and to bow to the Council of Ancients of the Corps Legislatives, simple acknowledgement of the army of Italy's service. But he was, in reality, outrageously aggrandizing himself in images on the obverse and words on the edge of the medal, and thereby taking all the credit for the victory. The best propaganda is always the propaganda that is hiding in plain sight. Even back in Paris, the French newspaper Le Moniteur, perhaps fed by a letter from Napoleon himself, as he was wont to do, had swallowed Napoleon's fishing tackle, hook, line and sinker, when it reported, The army of Italy has thought up a new way of promulgating the decrees which declared so many times that they deserved the gratitude of the nation. When news of these decrees reached the army, they had struck a medal as a sign of this recognition, bearing on one side the date of the decree and on the other a representation of the action that earned them the gratitude of the nation. According to Le Moniteur, then, Napoleon had nothing to do with striking the medals, even though his fingerprints were all over them. It was some faceless entity called the Army of Italy. Even if the medals had never been officially sanctioned, who could criticise such a valorous and conveniently amorphous entity as that? But the men of the directory were cunning political survivors and were certainly not fooled by Napoleon's crafty propagandistic methods. It was not as if Napoleon was hiding his ambitions by 1797 either, when he told the French ambassador to Tuscany at his headquarters in Milan that What I have done so far is nothing. I am only at the beginning of the career that lies before me. Do you suppose that I have triumphed in Italy for the mere aggrandizement of the directory lawyers, the Carnots, the Barras of this world? What an idea! Wayne Hanley, quoting the historian Jean Toulard, summarises Napoleon's incipient ambitions as follows. From the time of Lodi, Bonaparte's eyes were turned towards Paris. He was aware of the unpopularity of the directory. 
he also knew that the power was there to be taken. For any soldier of the army of Italy who owned or even occasionally came across these medals, he could feel pride that not only had he been part of this historic campaign and was being recognised for it in bronze by his nation, but that it was eternally linked to his commander and hero, General Bonaparte, who had the condescension to climb down off his horse and to stand shoulder to shoulder with him at the Battle of Lodi under withering gunfire and to help the common soldier aim his gun at the enemy or to cross the bridge at Lodi with him under a hail of musket balls. Is there any wonder why Napoleon was beloved by his soldiers, even while he mercilessly used them to forge his own destiny? See here Appiani's second medal design in I Fasti di Napoleone, this time for the Battle of Castiglione and combat at Peschiera, also engraved by Carlo Levi. Here we see on the obverse the hero representing the army of Italy, or, with a sly wink, perhaps Napoleon himself, in the act of fighting a warrior representing Austria, while Appiani's original design had a Latin inscription meaning the army of Italy is always the victor. Lavi has simply engraved the Battle of Castiglione, combat at Pascera, which once again, like his first medal, allows the viewer to ask themselves who is the hero meant to be here. Once again, we have the raised inscription on the edge of the medal, Bonaparte, General-in-Chief, to give us a subtle hint in the right direction. The warrior's battle rages over the dead or dying body of a warrior representing the Sardinians, who by this time had already been taken out of the war by Napoleon. Napoleon is clearly winning here, having disabled the kneeling warrior and by grasping the man's sword hand, and he looks as though he is about to deliver the coup de grace to the beleaguered Austrian. We suspect the kneeling warrior is meant to represent Austria because he is wearing a curiously abbreviated Shaco hat, similar to the hat worn by the Grenze Infanterie, the Hungarian border soldiers, a short, visorless, stovepipe-style hat as seen in Le Comte's painting of the surrender of Mantua. We can see that La Vie, closely following Appiani's original design, has strictly adhered to the sage prescriptions of the Messiah of Neoclassicism, Johann Joachim Winkelmann, as to how an artist is to strive to reach the pinnacle of perfection in his art. Firstly, he represents the ideal he finds in nature, just as the Greeks did, not the multifarious and confusing individuality of nature itself, as the Rococo did so lavishly and with such insouciance. How wrong those artists like Fragonard or Tiepolo were. They were wrong, wrong, wrong. On this point, Winkelmann quotes Raphael, to whose perfection the neoclassicists were forever comparing themselves, as telling Baldassare Castiglione, the great Renaissance author of Il Cortigiano, the courtier, that for the painting of his Galatea, he was going to ensure in its execution that sense, beauty being so seldom found among the fair, I avail myself of a certain ideal image. See how Appiani and La Vie have followed this advice, ensuring the warriors have an ideal male form and classically muscular physique. They lack individuality and could be interchangeable, similar to the idealised warriors fighting on a Greek vase, who Winkelmann so adored. Secondly, to strive for perfection, Appiani and La Vie followed Winkelmann's prescription with regard to outline or contour, as he calls it. Winkelmann, in his Reflections on Greek Art, points out that the noblest contour unites or circumscribes every part of the most perfect nature and the ideal beauties in the figure of the Greeks or rather, contains them both. And Winkelmann can give only Michelangelo as an example of a modern artist who comes close to the perfection of the Greeks in contour. But he also explains why Michelangelo could not match the Greeks. He said that for Michelangelo, perfection was possible 
only in his strong, muscular figures, heroic frames, not in those of tender youth, nor in female bodies, which, under his bold hand, grew Amazons. In reviewing some of Michelangelo's female statues, I am afraid we must agree with Winkelmann on this last point. They look a lot like his men, but with perfunctory breasts. Winkelmann's third pronouncement is concerning drapery, but as our Castiglione figures are nude classical warriors, like those seen here in the Greek Pankration, we will pass by this point and leave it until we reach Apiani's design for the surrender of Mantua medal, in which clothed figures are prominent. However, we can certainly apply Winkelmann's fourth and final prescription for neoclassical perfection, expression. In Winkelmann's opinion, the last and most eminent characteristic of the Greek works is a noble simplicity and sedate grandeur in gesture and expression. As the bottom of the sea lies peaceful beneath a foaming surface, a great soul lies sedate beneath the strife of passions in Greek figures. Surely Winkelmann is not putting forward the stiff upper lip of the English or the Germanic peoples as one of the highest ideals to follow in artistic expression. That would be too facile. It's more likely that he was admiring the artistic expression of that long philosophical tradition of the Greek and Roman world, the Stoicism of Epictetus and Marcus Aurelius, by which a person does not deny their emotions, but learns to become master of them. Winkelmann puts forward the Lacoon as an example of this, and is it any surprise that one of Appiani's brilliant pieces of neoclassicism is the sketch he made of this statue when he was on sabbatical in Rome? In any case, see here how La Vie, closely following Appiani's design, demonstrates this fourth prescription of Winkelmann's, with the warriors expressing exertion and concentration on their faces, but avoiding extremes of emotion. Naturally, unlike a painting on a larger scale, the engraving of a medal gives less scope for an artist to demonstrate this aspect of Winkelmann's neoclassicism simply due to the technical limitations of creating an image no bigger than a few millimetres struck in copper. But we can see the intention of restraint is there. We see here Appiani's third medal design in I Fasti di Napoleone, this time for the surrender of Mantua, also engraved by Carlo Lavi. Wayne Hanley explains how quickly after the Battle of Lodi the Milan Mint medals were contemplated and their designs completed. The first three medals, commemorating the earliest of Bonaparte's stunning victories, were authorised over a span of four months, between May and August 1796. It would be another five months before the fourth medal in the Five Battles series would appear, this one memorialising the army's capture of the fortress city of Mantua. The second of the Milan Mint medals Hanley mentions, the crossing of the Po, Adda and Mincio, with its image of the French army rushing across the bridge at Lodi, was engraved not by Carlo Lavi, but by Franz Salvioc, engraver at the Milan Mint. And we will come to discuss this second medal later, after we have discussed the medals we know were definitely designed by Appiani and engraved by Carlo Lavi, those Appiani painted in the Palazzo Real and which were engraved in I Fasti di Napoleone. In his design for the Mantua medal, Appiani has placed two classical figures, a woman and an ancient warrior, facing each other amongst the reeds and bulrushes on the marshy bank of the Mincio River, with the causeway that crosses the Mincio to connect Mantua to the surrounding countryside in the background. Both the woman's and the warrior's images are redolent with associations and connotations, not to mention the ancient symbolic importance of the bridge behind them, representing, among other concepts, the passing from one state of being to another, which we shall discuss at length in the Battle of Lodi Medal later. In the first analysis, it's, it's true. The woman can be seen simply 
as the personification of the city of Mantua, handing over the keys of the city gate to Napoleon. But the turreted mural crown she wears upon her head, which has so often been used since Roman times as a symbol in civic heraldry for the towns of Italy, suggests that more than just Mantua is being delivered into the hands of Napoleon. Throughout Italian history, the use of the turreted mural crown, particularly when worn by a woman with a curvaceous, traditionally maternal figure as she is here, became so widespread as a representation of Italian towns that there gradually arose an overarching personification or allegory for the Italian peninsula as a whole. Italia Turita. Here she is in all her glory. Historians suggest she is derived from the primordial mother goddess, first traced to Cybele, a fertility deity of Anatolian origin who was known to and worshipped by the Romans, and Cybele just happens to wear a turreted mural crown. When they worshipped her in Republican Rome, she saved them from Hannibal, and this memory of a maternal figure who watches over and cares for the populace must have transmitted itself as what we would refer to today as a meme to later generations of Italians and into the distant future. Virgil, beloved of the Romans, who was by happenstance from a little village outside Mantua, wrote in the Aeneid about how Sabele protected Aeneas on his journey, and further, during the Roman social war during the first century before Christ, the figure of Sabele began to represent the vision of a peaceful and unified Italy under the Romans, just as Aeneas had escaped the conquered Troy and journeyed to Italy and became the progenitor of the Romans who went on to pacify the Latin peoples. No wonder then that Appiani and Lavi had chosen to represent Napoleon as a hero in a sort of semi-Greek, semi-Roman costume who might have been perfectly at home in the time of the Trojan Wars when Aeneas performed his miraculous journey and deeds. Napoleon has the helmet and crest, spear and shield of an ancient Greek, with the breastplate and armoured skirt of a Roman. He could be Aeneas, and, as far as Appiani and Lavie were concerned, he most likely was meant to be. It's important to remember at this point that Mantua was the last fortress that was holding the French back from overrunning the whole of the Italian peninsula. If Napoleon could expel the Austrians from Mantua, he was unrestrained in his conquest of Italy. Our curvaceous, matronly woman, Italia Turita, wearing the turreted mural crown and handing over the keys to Napoleon, is no longer only a personification of Mantua itself, but an allegory of the Italian peninsula as a whole. Italia Turita, handing over the keys of Italy to Napoleon. Here notice the difference between Appiani's original design and La Vie's. Someone, perhaps Napoleon, thought it much more impressive and propagandistically useful to have the medal show Italia Turita placing the keys to Italy into Napoleon's waiting hand, rather than in Appiani's design where he appears to be grasping them from her. All the while, the bridge behind them stands like a silent sentinel, observing the fact that Italy has now been transformed and will shortly pass into another state of being altogether. It is at this point that we can use the Surrender of Mantua medal to illustrate how Appiani has followed Winkelmann's third prescription regarding the striving of neoclassicism for artistic perfection, drapery. Note how Appiani has sought to make Italia Turita's clothes conform to Winkelmann's description of the way drapery should enhance the idealised form of the body beneath it, as exemplified by the statues of the Vestal Virgins now kept in Dresden, which were discovered at Herculaneum in 1706 and are now called the Herculaneum Women. As Winkelmann explains, the drapery of the Vestals above is grand and elegant. The smaller foldings spring gradually from the larger ones, and in them are lost again with noble freedom and gentle harmony of the whole, without hiding the correct contour 
of the body below. Here we see the design by Appiani in I Fasti di Napoleone for the crossing of the Tagliamento, capture of Trieste medal. It shows the river god of the Tagliamento river reclining amongst the reeds and rushes of the river bank, holding an amphora from which the source of the river flows. The river god appears to be reeling back in horror at the scene of the French army desecrating his river by crossing it to chase and rout the Austrians, who flee in panic and exit the scene stage right. The river god's right hand is raised in a gesture of command to the warring armies to cease their invasion of his tranquil domain. To no avail, I'm afraid. Close on the Austrians' heels, a French officer on his galloping charger with his sabre raised above his head, crashes into the torrent, followed closely behind by his soldiers, firing their muskets at the Austrians. Is the officer meant to be Napoleon? Examine the edge inscription. Perhaps that will help you decide. Once again, this medal is engraved by La Vie, who seems to have fairly faithfully reproduced Appiani's design, except that La Vie obviously found the number of soldiers drawn by La Vie both French and Austrians, too great to be clearly engraved upon the medal die. They would have been too small, and so La Vie appropriated an idea from another of Appiani's designs, which eventually made it into I Fasti di Napoleone, the crossing of the Lodi Bridge. See how similar Appiani's Lodi design and the final medal are, especially the position of the flag, the shape of the helmets of the French soldiers, the officer's bicorn hat, and his horses thrusting right hoof and forelock, and even the three fleeing Austrians on the right river bank. La Vie decided to make the officer raise his sword above his head, rather than in the Appiani design, where the sabre is let rest beside the horse. It enlivens the chase and increases the tension. It makes for a much clearer message in the limited space available on a medal, and after all, in the Appiani composition, there is no use in having the officer raise his sword in attack when in front of him on the bridge are his own soldiers. The position of Alpiani's sword is, from an artistic point of view, more balanced with regard to the rearing horse and overall composition, but Lavi was right in the technical confines of a medal to make the change, to abbreviate the column of soldiers and put the officer on his attack with his sabre raised and ready to slash down upon the heads of the fleeing Austrians. Lavi makes his point, so to speak, though not as elegantly as Appiani from an artistic point of view, and this makeshift approach of patching together two designs meant for totally different purposes by Appiani creates somewhat of a muddle in terms of the clash of human figures and styles within the medal. Appiani's Lodi design breathes neoclassical composure in the noble poses and gestures of the soldiers, and the controlled expression of emotions even in the heat of battle, as demanded by Winkelmann, while La Vie's engraving exudes hectic action and furious anger, in direct contrast to the elegant, restrained, yet expressive pose of the surprised and distressed river god of the Tagliamento. What is lost, however, in the lack of overall unity of neoclassical design in the composition of the medal, is made up for by the visual shock produced by the discordant juxtaposition of the somewhat cartoonish figures of the French rampaging through the Tagliamento river god's domain. While not a beautiful medal, the technique works. The message of violence and horror amidst a tranquil environment is grasped by the viewer in an instant. Having exhausted our analysis of the medals engraved by Carlo Levi, we now turn back to the so-called second medal of the Milan Mint series, Franz Salverk's medal, the crossing of the Po, Adda and Mincio rivers. We know that each of the Levi medals was engraved from designs by Andrea Appiani, but from whom did Salverk obtain a design for the second medal in this series? Was it Salverk's design alone? Or can we see some traces of Appiani's hand in it? Let us closely examine the obverse of the medal. 
We instantly note the similarity of the composition to Appiani's Lodi Bridge painting, recorded in I Fasti di Napoleone, where the officer is charging on horseback across the bridge with sabre in hand, followed closely by officers and soldiers with swords drawn and muskets firing. This motif is very similar to the officer on horseback and his soldiers forging the river in La Vie's medal, Crossing of the Tagliamento, which we have just examined. I suspect both La Vie and Salvia took their designs from Appiani's Lodi Bridge and modified it in each case for their purposes. Although Salvioc is generally credited as a fine engraver of the period, I must admit I don't find the execution of this medal particularly agreeable. It certainly doesn't have the neoclassical decorum of Appiani's design, either in the drafting of the individual figures or in the overall composition. The soldiers, small as they are on a 40 mm medal due to necessity, are gawky, disjointed mannequins and cannot be but pale shadows of Appiani's well-realised ideal bodies. And Salviuk has jumbled them all up together in a hotchpotch on the bridge behind their officer on horseback who, by his prominence at the centre of the medal, and his lanky hair must surely suggest to the viewer that the officer is... Napoleon. Once again, we are reminded of this by the raised inscription on the medal's edge, Bonaparte, General in Chief. Yet, despite the poor artistic quality of the medal, we get the message, and hence the medal is successful in its purpose at this level. The French soldiers are so eager to attack the Austrians that they almost fall over themselves, and in their bravery and enthusiasm to reach the enemy, almost outran the courageous Napoleon himself on his charging and rearing horse. Overall, perhaps, the more interesting aspect of the medal is its inscription. Although the image relates to the crossing of a single small bridge at Lodi, the inscription points instead to the achievement of crossing three major rivers in northern Italy. The medalist, therefore, is pointing to a much bigger idea than the rather minor skirmish at Lodi the conquest of the whole of northern Italy, which, by implication, means the expulsion of the Austrians. If we think of the medal's message in military terms, these three rivers, the Po, the Adda and the Mincio, were thought by the Austrians to be like protective moats that they could defend, and which would stymie and eventually grind down the French advance. So the bold, almost reckless crossing of these three rivers in quick succession by Napoleon confused and unbalanced the austere and conservative Austrian generals and kept them ceaselessly on the defensive. Napoleon was a master of kinetic, not static, warfare and the message on the medal can be seen as a celebration also of his energetic, quick-witted, imaginative approach to war. But if we think of the medal from an allegorical point of view, not only from the geographical and the political points of view, then we should consider what the crossing of so many rivers in general signifies. The historian Wayne Hanley suggests that viewers at the time of the medal's release would have found the crossing of a bridge or a river rich with associations and meaning. The crossing of the Lodi Bridge and the battle at Lodi itself were in reality of very little importance to the outcome of the French campaign, even though Napoleon shamelessly lied about its significance, telling the Directory there were double the number of Austrians opposing him at the bridge, 18,000, and that he'd killed or wounded 3,000 of them. However, as a symbol, it was of immense propagandistic value to Napoleon's destiny. In essence, a river represents a boundary, and a bridge provides a rare if not unique opportunity to cross that boundary from one region, or if we think metaphysically one state of being, to another. As we've already seen, Napoleon's crossing of the Lodi Bridge had an almost metaphysical effect upon the young Bonaparte himself. It convinced him of his genius and his destiny to conquer. But from the point of view of someone living at that time, who was examining the medal, what would it bring to mind? For the average Frenchman, perhaps it would signify that Napoleon was leading the avant-garde of the revolution, represented by the soldiers, to their inevitable destiny, of not only freeing themselves from the shackles of slavery, but also the Italians, and perhaps in time the rest of Europe too. For those of the time with a classical education, 
there would have been allusions to the great Romans of antiquity who had made themselves legendary by their heroic deeds at a bridge. We can think of the defence of the Sublician Bridge by Horatius Cocles, or the crossing of the Milvian Bridge by Emperor Constantine, who in doing so happened to be energised by a revolutionary state of mind like Napoleon, but in his case it was Christianity rather than republicanism. For the religious of the period, similarities to the life of Christ were unavoidable. The believer, General Bonaparte, who would later as emperor re-establish the Catholic Church amongst the French nation, was a Christ-like figure. He was the saviour of the French nation for breaking the deadlock of the war that the French people were fighting against a combined aristocratic Europe, and he miraculously thwarted invasion which would re-establish feudalism in France and drive them all back into slavery. Whatever symbolism the medal represented to the viewer of the day, it was highly likely that after seeing it, the message of Salverk's little medal was not forgotten. Napoleon was a man the French could put their trust in. It was the message the French probably longed for after the horrors of the revolution and the war, but it was the beginning of a dangerous addiction to glory that would eventually lead to the downfall of Napoleon and to the downfall of Andrea Appiani along with him. The number of medals counted by numismatists amongst what I have called in this episode the Milan Mint Medals usually stops at five. However, I include a sixth medal here engraved by Franz Salviak for reasons that I will mention in a moment. The five medals traditionally discussed together as commemorating the battles of Napoleon's first Italian campaign rightly belong together, since they were all struck with the recognition that Napoleon's actions in each case were sanctioned and approved of by the French government, as witnessed by the reverses of the medals, stamped as they are with the five laws passed by the Council of Ancients of the Corps Législative to honour them. Further, as we have seen, the five medals are thematically and stylistically similar, with each of the five medals being either designed by Andrea Appiani, or at least based upon his work. The sixth medal, the taking of the Broletto Palace, is completely different from the other five. The design is not traceable in any way to Appiani. It does not commemorate a battle in which Napoleon directly fought. It is not thematically and stylistically similar to the others, and it does not carry any legal recognition or approbation by the French government. It is, so to speak, an orphan, a lonesome child that cries out to be heard, and its story, which is usually ignored, should be heard in the context of Napoleon's Italian campaign, so as to add nuance and complexity to a story that otherwise primarily concentrates only upon Napoleon's supposedly unalloyed victories and success. The story of the conquest of northern Italy in 1796 and 1797 by the French, as you will see, is far more complicated than that, and it reveals the true level of Napoleon's skullduggery, what we would refer to today as his clandestine operations, or his black ops. While the Broletto Palace medal is of little artistic value or interest in itself, its design being rather a muddle of small figures racing about in all directions, it does record an obscure yet fascinating and important series of events that took place during the first Italian campaign, which threatened Napoleon's conquest of northern Italy, even as he had chased the Austrians out of it. What makes this challenge to the French army particularly fascinating is that it came not from the Austrians, but spontaneously from the Italian people themselves, whom Napoleon somewhat disingenuously declared that he had liberated willingly and enthusiastically from the Austrians. In essence, the medal is a reminder that a large section of the population of Lombardy did not want to be liberated by the French at all, at least not on Napoleon's terms. On the obverse of the medal, we see a scene with officers and soldiers attacking and entering the Proletto Palace in Brescia, the seat of local government, while on the reverse around the edge we see the legend Epoca della Libertà Bresciana, 
in English something like the era of Brescia's liberty, with a laurel wreath enclosing the Peleus Compugio of Roman antiquity, which is the cap of liberty and the dagger, along with the date in Italian, 18th of March, 1797. Clearly the inscription is in Italian, unlike the inscriptions on the other five medals in the series, which are in French. So obviously this is a medal intended for the local population. The reason is obvious. Napoleon, who probably had to authorise the medal, or if he did not, his enablers who did authorise it, would have wanted the Italian populace to believe that the Broretto Palace had been taken over by a popular uprising of local Italians in an attempt to liberate Brescia from the tyrannical Venetians, who had governed Venetian Lombardy for centuries and were in league with the Austrians. To drive the message home to the Italians, the designer of the medal has placed a potent ancient Italian symbol of resistance against tyranny and emancipation from slavery at the heart of the medal's reverse, the cap of liberty and the dagger, which were used by Brutus on his coins to advertise that he had assassinated Julius Caesar so as to crush dictatorship and to return the people to the freedom they enjoyed under the Roman Republic. The Peleus, or cap, was worn in Roman times by slaves, after they had been freed by their master. Here, however, the designer of the medal has ominously given it the look of the French Republican cap of liberty, the Phrygian cap, rather than its ancient Italian progenitor. While the soothsayer told Caesar, Beware the Ides of March, Napoleon tells the Italians, Celebrate the Ides of March. You have freed yourself from tyranny. The Ides of March take place on the 15th of March every year, the date by which the Romans were meant to settle debts. Convenient to this ancient warning, the Proletto Palace was taken over on the 18th of March, 1797. Here we see Napoleon, or his minions, at their most nefariously propagandistic, because what really happened on the 18th of March was that the French stirred up a mob composed of local Italian Jacobins, proselytizers of democracy and republicanism, and had them march on the Brescia town hall, where, egged on by a few French agents, they were emboldened to overthrow the local government of Brescia by storming the Proletto. The French army, of course, was waiting in the wings to support the insurrection. This coup d'etat was organised by the French because they could see that the general Italian populace were becoming discontented with the French occupiers, who though initially promising simply to pass through on their way to fight the Austrians, had decided to stay a while, set down roots and take over the place. The French didn't want to be seen as tyrants themselves by taking over Brescia, so they organised for some local Italian dupes to do it for them. It's little wonder that the raised inscription, Bonaparte, General-in-Chief, seen on the other five medals, is nowhere to be seen on the edge of the Proletto medal. Napoleon didn't want his fingerprints visible on this one. Napoleon had previously done the same thing in Bergamo, but his agents did it so ham-fistedly that it was obvious to the Italian population that it was the French who had really taken over the city. Napoleon wanted the coup d'etat to be done more authentically in Brescia than in Bergamo and to help him convince the rest of Italy that this was so, the Broletto medal was struck in commemoration. The problem with this little staged coup was that, that it did not ameliorate the anger of the local Italians against the French invaders, and so, within a few short days, the populace of nearby Verona had risen up against the French, and 1,000 French soldiers stationed there were overcome by the fury of the Veronese, because it occurred at Easter time. It has forevermore been celebrated proudly by the inhabitants of Verona as Pasque Veronese, or in English, the Veronese Easter. It began on the 17th of April, 1797, and went on only until the 25th, when 15,000 French soldiers laid siege to the city, and the Veronese Easter was finally snuffed out. A huge fine in money and artwork was imposed on the city by the French in compensation. Rebellions against the French invaders were also suppressed at Lonato and Salo. 
These incidents proved that for the Italians, the freedom they were promised by the French would have to come purely on General Bonaparte's terms, and they would be forced to accept that freedom at the barrel of a gun. That's the wonderful thing about propaganda. Human memory fades. Events can be remembered differently as time passes. But when the events are recorded for posterity, such as here on the medal, who can question that it happened the way the medal says, especially Italians yet to be liberated by Napoleon, and especially Italians who were not in Brescia on the 18th of March, 1797, or in Verona in the coming weeks during the uprising against the French invaders. Or perhaps Napoleon was not being disingenuous, and the propaganda was more direct and ominously threatening. Perhaps he was simply telling all Italians who opposed him that, if it came to it, like the Brescians and the Veronese, he would happily settle his debts to them, the debts brought on by their disobedience to his will. Beware the Ides of March. They say history is written by the victors, which may carry some truth. This documentary shows how Napoleon consciously and carefully crafted a narrative about his conquest of northern Italy that he wanted future generations to believe about him. His narrative was that he was an enlightened leader who defeated aristocratic despotism and religious superstition and tyranny and brought to the Italian people their inherent human rights purely out of goodwill and brotherhood, but who did it at the cost of his own deep personal sacrifice and that of the common Frenchman. His enemies, the Austrians of course, had a competing narrative of their own, less charitable to Napoleon. So did the citizens of Verona, as we have seen. But at times, and under specific circumstances, the vanquished too can also be the ones to manufacture a narrative that will be handed down by the generations to come. For example, after Napoleon died in 1821 on St. Helena, defeated and a prisoner of the British, French patriots carried on Napoleon's memory and used it to rally the French nation to further their own causes. For example, Lieutenant General Poulet, a general under Napoleon, and an historian speaking in the French Corps Législative in 1836 asserted that the enemies of Napoleon have reproached him for an insatiable ambition, a frenzied passion for battles. These accusations will be denied by history, and they already are. It will prove that the foreign kings continued against the empire, the coalition formed at Pilnitz against the revolution of 1789, and intended to re-establish the Bourbon family with absolute power. It will prove that these sovereigns waged a war to the death in Napoleon against the representative of the revolution, and that the emperor was obliged to bring the theatre of combat into the midst of foreign countries in order to keep it away from French territory. Napoleon's aggression, then, was really defence. His conquest, simply an attempt to maintain the status quo. Here, Pelet frames Napoleon as the sacrificial hero, just as David had framed Marat as the dead Christ in his Pietà, with both crucified on the cross of the revolution, purely for the benefit of the French people. Whether Poulet was a good historian, I do not know, but he certainly had a gift for rhetoric, and as to his propaganda, I am sure Napoleon would have heartily approved. Returning to the brilliant propaganda of the Milan mint medals, we have to mention at this point that if it were not for Dominique Vivant Denon, perhaps Napoleon's greatest propagandist, the medals might have been much less well known than they are today, and may not have had such a powerful impact upon Napoleon's career and subsequent rise to consul and ultimately emperor. You see, 
When Napoleon left Europe after his first conquest of northern Italy to conduct his fateful Egyptian campaign, the Austrians and the Russians successfully invaded Italy and drove out the French. During this brief period before Napoleon's return, the hubs from which the dyes were made to strike the Milan mint medals were scooped up by the retreating French forces and carried off to Paris, where Denon eventually had new dyes made to continue striking the medals in volume in Paris, so as to secure Napoleon's glorious reputation in the minds and the imaginations of the French people. Inspired by their effect upon the populace, Denon set about producing his own medals, each one a celebration of Napoleon's success and brilliance. This would become the Napoleonic series of medals which we discuss in this series of documentaries. As to Andrea Appiani, who profited so much from Napoleon's conquests, and from whom, as a result, we have such a wealth of neoclassical masterpieces, but who lost so much after the fall of Napoleon's regime in Italy, perhaps we should leave the final words. Here, in Appiani's own words, is his meditation upon the power that Napoleon's personality and the public projection of that personality, his propaganda, had to motivate men and to induce a frame of mind in his followers which led them to do incredible heroic, self-destructive things, and which enabled the citizens around them to accept such sacrifice. It was in those times of fanaticism usual to hear from Napoleon's soldiers the motto either to win or to die. No one seemed to think about death, intoxicated by easy honours, Families were in ecstasy from the advancement of their children and saw no danger. Looking just beyond that time, we could say of Italy with Alfieri what he said of Sparta. Mothers in Sparta aim for their sons to die for the fatherland and rejoice. They count the wounds and wash them, kissing them from happy, not painful tears and it is joyful for them to give more sons if they have them. Seneca said, in relation to these beings who are so determined to reach eternity, whatever it is, Numquam est, ille maesa, cui facile est mori. Never is he miserable for whom dying is easy.